risk of sounding really elitist, I'm going to say Dr. Sharona Frederick. <laughs> Not because I want you to bow down to me, but because I busted my... <laughs> so, yes, yeah, so anybody who has that, that doctorate did. Okay, so I want to say, before I start giving you um, some facts about uh, Dr. Barbara Acker's very impressive biography, I want to say something personal, actually, about both, both Barbara and Margaret Knapp. Where is she? Here in the audience as well. So Professor uh, Barbara Acker and Professor Margaret Knapp, both of these wonderful women, uh, Kendra and I got to know uh, during a Shakespeare workshop last semester, and we were so taken with their their brilliance and their friendliness, which is often a really unusual combination in academia. What about that? <laughs> that we decided to kidnap them <laughs> into uh, this wonderful series that we've started and which we will be continuing. That's my warning to the two of them. You will be kidnapped again in the future. And I just want to say that it has been a tremendous pleasure, correct, Kendra, for both of us working with Barbara and Margaret. So. On that embarrassing note for the two of you, now that you both want to, you know, take a hold for yourselves. They're wonderful people to work with. And I'm sure there's also one, one thing, those of you who are at Margaret's lecture, those of you tonight who were here at Barbara's, uh, you note that they are approachable and friendly as well as quite intelligent. And I do encourage you um, to ask, ask questions. So now let me tell you a little bit about the professional side. That was me getting all gushy, but true. <laughs> so, Barbara Acker was a professor at Arizona State University for 19 years. And prior to that, she was at SUNY Binghamton, which is great. I have my doctorate from a SUNY school, so... Long live Stony Brook, but Binghamton is also excellent, so I know that's a very good system. The University of Miami, uh, which is also a very fine school, and LSU at Baton Rouge. So, very impressive roster of places to have taught and researched in. Um, she has taught and coached Shakespeare in all of those places, and she also was the past president of the Voice and Speech Trainers of America, a very interesting organization called VASTA, which reaches across continents, goes into, am I correct, as far away as South Korea, South Africa? South Korea and South Africa. South Korea and South Africa, so there you go. May I also do a book plug? for Professor Barbara Acker. She is a co-editor uh, together with Marion Hampton of a very interesting book called The Vocal Vision. I'm going to repeat that for anybody writing it down. The Vocal Vision, uh, which includes very interesting articles on many things having to do with Shakespeare. Shakespeare in prison, not only Shakespeare, vocal coaching, training actors for the theater. Um, she's done a tremendous amount of things, and I now am going to be quiet, but I will tell you that in listening to Barbara, you will have a person who has, um, you'll be hearing a person who has not only a fine understanding of theater and literature, but um, like her friend Margaret Knapp, is simply a delight to work with. So, on that. No. Too generous, but I thank you anyway. Um, I want to first begin with an apology to the German language, which I will soon be mangling. <laughs> so, um, this is about Shakespeare under the swastika and the Union Jack, and it's about Shakespeare and propaganda in World War II. So, our first um, essential question is, what's propaganda? Well, it has started out as a good term, spreading, disseminating. The Catholic Church founded a committee in 1622 that was spreading the faith, and they used the word spreading propaganda. But it became, certainly by the 20th century, a very negative, if not sinister, term. It describes what a government or institution does when it instigates a deliberate, systematic attempt to persuade people to embrace a belief, faith, or actions. Persuasion itself is usually good. Uh, this is difficult. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Persuasion uh, itself is usually good, but uh, propaganda is uh, simply, I'm sorry, this threw me off. Um, 
but propaganda misleads people with biased arguments, manipulating, even lying to them to gain their own ends. So, in Shakespeare's time, um, excuse me, in wartime, propaganda became good persuasion, a tool government relied on to help the nation survive. So propaganda depends on easily recognized figures or concepts that can arouse emotions or sympathy. And certainly, as we'll see, Shakespeare was one of those figures to arouse sympathy. Right now, I'd like to talk about the simplest, most blatant examples of posters used in wartime in both Britain and, the Uni and Germany to arouse uh, all kinds of feelings along with instructing people. This one has two monster-like hands, Japan and Nazi Germany, clawing at a mother and child. So this clearly identifies and demonizes the enemies. The vulnerable family is threatened by total horrible war. So the message should arouse fear and hate. And then we have here a quote from Shakespeare. Stand not upon the order of your going, but go at once. Enlist now. <laughs> and so even if a British citizen did not recognize the Macbeth <coughs> quote, they certainly understood the urgency of enlist now. The next shows the bucolic, green, and pleasant land that stands for Britain, for its people, its way of life. The subtle message is that Britain is peaceful, and therefore the nation is a victim of aggression and has to defend itself. This is an industrial worker. Certainly in wartime, the factory worker is as important as the frontline fighters. So the men and women on the assembly lines are celebrated here. This message underscores also we're all in this together. We should recognize these. Keep calm and carry on. Freedom is in peril. Defend it with all your might. Your courage, your cheerfulness, your resolution will bring us victory. In addition to instructing citizens on how to observe a, a blackout, how to ration, how to save food. You also need to boost morale. And these little sayings, these posters, not only boost the morale, but instill a belief that calm persistence will bring victory. Germany also had its propaganda posters. Here is a German worker also contributing to the war effort. This cheerful German youth is doing her bit as well. So now, Shakespeare is ready to enter the war as a piece of cultural propaganda. Because remember, cultural icons, even our sports stars, are appropriated to endorse values, sell products. It's hardly surprising that this revered cultural icon was pressed into service to sell the idea of good people battling a bad enemy. What's strange, perhaps, at least for us, is that both Britain and Germany staked a claim on the Bard for propaganda purposes. I want to talk first about how Great Britain used Shakespearean plays to advance their cause. So here we are, propaganda. Um, <clears throat> Britain had a long tradition of Shakespearean performance. He was popular with actors and audiences. But by the 20th century, uh, the production of Shakespeare's plays had fallen off. Commercial theaters found him unprofitable unless they offered a star-studded cast. Well, Shakespeare, though, was embedded in culture in so many other ways. The Shakespeare Memorial Theater at Stratford-upon-Avon had a company that by 1934 was offering a five-month-long season from spring through summer. They didn't make a lot of money. They just sort of lived on a shoestring budget. The Old Vic in London had the same financial, uh, you know, limited means. But 
under uh, Lillian Bayless's management, she was responsible for the first complete cycle of Shakespearean plays done in England, who knows, in a long time. She staged them from the years 1914 to 1923. Her resident company even pulled in some leading stars like Laurence Olivier, John Gilgood, and, and uh, Richardson. Sadly, Bayless was the mm, exception, not the rule, in her determination to do Shakespeare, Shakespeare, Shakespeare. The Bard, however, was taught in schools, public schools, private schools, universities, Cambridge, Oxford. Students performed his plays in school, so Shakespeare, in a sense, was domesticated. He could become a warm school memory, especially for the elite who did him in Oxford and Cambridge. He became, in a way, the cultural property of the well healed. As a character in Jane Austen's novel, Mansfield Park, makes clear uh, a century earlier. This man begins, but Shakespeare, one gets acquainted without knowing how. It's a part of an Englishman's constitution. His thoughts and beauties are so spread abroad that one touches them everywhere. One is intimate with him by instinct. No man of any brain can open a good part of one of his plays without falling into the flow of his meaning immediately. In quotes. Tell that to high school students. Shakespeare. But Shakespeare's language, his images, his characters had seeped into everyday use in Britain. He was a universally recognized figure who represented conservative Anglo-Saxon values and British cultural superiority. Since he was freighted with these associations of high art, high culture, education, national superiority, he was the cultural icon par excellence. So, he was recruited by the British government during World War II to present the national case at home and abroad to build support for the war, to booster morale, to raise pride in British national identity and heritage. Shakespeare represented the country and the values that the British were fighting for, their superiority and ultimately their will and ability to win. Now, against that, Britons at this time in the 30s like comedies and thrillers. And so here is a typical little commercially viable play called Square Pegs, showing at the Sheffield Repertory Theater. So how do you inspire the theaters to turn from this kind of play that fills the seats to Shakespeare who isn't filling the seats? Well, the office responsible for propaganda was the Ministry of, Ed of Information was resurrected after it had been ended in, after World War I. Its remit covered newspapers, posters, film, um, newsreels, and radio, not theater. However, <laughs> early in the war, January 1940, the government established the Council for the Encouragement of Music and the Arts, or SEMA, C-E-M-A. For the first time in British history, the government used treasury funds to subsidize select ballet, opera, and theater companies. SEMA's mission was to promote popular uh, um, education and propaganda through the arts. In a war that was increasingly fought on the home front, the council saw an urgent need for entertainment beyond merely distracting war-weary audiences. The council argued for a greater role for the arts, uh, argued their impact on society as propaganda, the need for the arts to bolster morale. The war against Nazi Germany was no ordinary war. It was a conflict between ideologies. It was a struggle to defend the values of the civilized world against Nazi barbarism. Britain was fighting for its very survival. As Seema saw it, the theater for this task had to be uplifting, educational, and national. Seema saw about um, bringing theater, including Shakespeare, to cities, rural areas, as well as industrial and evacuee centers. 
among the biggest theatrical successes in hostels for factory workers, um, for example, were a tour they had through all these centers of Twelfth Night and Hedda Gabler. Commentators noted after the war that, quote, some hundred new centers are now playing and enjoying regular concerts and plays where only ten years before nothing of the kind ever ex was heard of, end quotes. An early SEMA project, the council helped the Old Vic tour Britain with a series of plays. Eight of them were Shakespearean. <coughs> now here is Sybil Thorndike. She's uh, posed in her role as Lady Macbeth. So the first Old Vic tour sent out was uh, Macbeth, and <clears throat> it was touring 38 Welsh mining villages in 10 weeks. Now, they wrote a prologue for this play, so it was spoken to the audience, urging them to think of Macbeth as Hitler. Quote, you needn't always think of dictators in terms of concentration camps and tanks and airplanes. Men don't change in a thousand years. What Macbeth wanted, what all such people want, is power. This play is about a tyrant, a dictator, end quotes. Sybil Thorndike, who played Lady Macbeth and the First Witch, said, quote, We never played to such audiences. None of them moved a muscle while we were playing. But the end, they went wild and lifted the roof with their clapping, end quotes. The tour was widely publicized by the Ministry of Information in their propaganda publications, including such things as bulletins from Britain. The magazine, Bulletins, featured articles about the theater and in particular about productions of Shakespearean drama, and it more or less linked the success of these ventures to the total British war effort. Seema's biggest and most influential undertakings, however, were First, the refurbishing of the Theatre Royal Bristol, opening it as the first state theater in British history. And two, the old um, Vic was established as a permanent repertory company offering the classics. Mm. Here is one of the old Vic productions, and what we have is Ralph Richardson here battling the evil Laurence Olivier as Richard III. So the old Vic became the de facto national theater. And the Shakespearean productions of the early war years featured many actors like these who were, quote, appearing for next to nothing at the old Vic because they realized that the battle of the old Vic is one we cannot afford to lose, end quotes. It was about defending Britain's cultural heritage in a time of total war. The Old Vic's greatest successes were King Lear and The Tempest, played to capacity houses. There were a few stalwart actors and producers who didn't have SEMA funds but went on doing Shakespeare. And one of the most indefatigable Shakespearean actors was Donald Wolfett. Here he is in his costume for his 1943-44 West End performance as King Lear. Uh, but he is most famous for in the war for a series of popular lunchtime performances. He called it a daily hour and shillings worth of speeches, songs, and sonnets at the Strand Theatre. He and his company performed even through the Battle of Britain when the dressing rooms at their theater were blown to bits. Wolfett called it an incredible season. He said later, what did we play? Anything that came into our heads is a suitable short scene. The three casket scene for Merchant of Venice, the Orsino and Viola scenes, and much more. So he soldiered on under great hardship. Perhaps the most notable, at least on this side of the pond, propaganda success is Laurence Olivier's 1944 film, Henry V. He was both the director and the actor. <clears throat> and if there was ever a Shakespearean play to boost morale, it was certainly Henry V. 
Interesting, this is sort of a footnote. The government didn't fund this film. It was produced by Filippo del Guidici, an Italian refugee who had fled Mussolini's Italy. But here, Laurence Olivier, in his role as king, promised the nation as well as his caste that the aroused British spirit could defeat overwhelming odds. The film, needless to say, was a tremendous success. Shakespeare in the war years was certainly affirmed by the British as our great national poet. And the Manchester Guardian asserted, quote, no better national service can be given at the present time than to present Shakespearean <coughs> repertory. End quotes. It would be difficult to quantify exactly how much fighting spirit Shakespeare put into British backbones, but his plays meant a great deal to the beleaguered nation. The wartime support of Seema led to the establishment, after the war, of the Arts Council and the financial support of the arts, not to mention the creation of the Royal Shakespeare Company and the Royal National Theatre. And I see today, when I go to England, <laughs> Shakespeare is one of the major industries, and I go to see <laughs> Shakespeare plays. So certainly the two theaters benefited from the British government's recognition of the importance of support, if not propaganda. Well, Shakespeare and propaganda in Nazi Germany. The National Socialists, or as we know them, the Nazis, took control of Germany when Hitler was appointed chancellor on January 30th, 1933. Hitler strove to sell the idea that Germany was part of a higher reality, that the nation was entering a new period of history, the Third Reich. The Nazis even staged politics as theatrical events, like the grandiose Nuremberg rallies, state funerals, sporting events, national festivals, and theatrical events. Because theater speaks directly to an audience, the Reich assumed that the images of the world that were portrayed on stage could be manipulated and interpreted to control what people thought and felt. So the Nazis believed theater was a vital tool of cultural politics, needed to spell out to people what to think and how to act. German theaters in the 1930s were not commercial enterprises at the complete mercy of the box office. Nobles supported their court theaters, and either city councils or bourgeois theater societies subsidized, at least to some extent, municipal theaters. <coughs> Citizens saw theater as a public undertaking important for education and social welfare. So, in contrast to the struggles that British producers were having, trying to use light entertainment to make some money, German audiences demanded their ballet, opera, and serious drama. Theater was very much a middle-class institution and taken very seriously. And this helped the Nazis because theaters, including all the people who worked for them, were used to directives and guidance from these nobles or from the city council. So, <clears throat> now, this is a cartoon that was published in a German ma uh, magazine in 1941. Shakespeare sits on a throne in Mount Olympus, and there stands Goethe and Wagner. And the ghosts of Goethe and Wagner assure Shakespeare that his words live on in Germany, while Shakespeare laments back to them that they are all all three of these characters are absent from English stages. <coughs> Germany could proudly proclaim that they produced more Shakespearean plays than England did. In fact, Shakespeare's plays were performed more in Germany than any other playwright. One Nazi author said, quote, Shakespeare belongs to us as much as he does to the English. Indeed, we know him and perform his plays better than they do, end quotes. So, 
Hitler appointed Joseph Goebbels to head the all-important Ministry of Propaganda and Public Enlightenment. The ministry was organized into seven departments or chambers, theater, film, radio, literature, fine arts, the press. So now writers, artists were civil servants with a duty to promote the aims of the nation. This is the chief dramaturg, Re <coughs> Reiner Schlosser. He was empowered to oversee and guide play selection for all 248 German theaters. And he had to censor any anti-national socialists, i.e. any anti-Nazi <coughs> play choices or scripts. Now, you can tell how important theater was to the Nazi by two things. First, by the attention they paid to it. The Department of Theater and Schlosser, the dramaturg, oversaw play selection, production style, acting style, critical reception, and scholarly interpretation of all plays. And secondly, and I think this is more important, the Ministry of Propaganda gave enormous subsidies to theaters of the total propaganda budget. 26, nearly 27% went to theaters, 22% went to propaganda, posters, radio, and only 11.5% to films. I think it'd be the opposite for Americans. <laughs> Goebbels declared, quote, German art of the next decade will be heroic, steely romantic, factual, without sentimentality, and mindful of its communal duty, or it won't exist. Theater, he goes on, has a cultural mission. The theaters not only form opinions, but also furnish entertainment, so that people do not collapse in misery and distress. So why Shakespeare? Well, this was cultural politics. And by promoting Shakespeare, the regime, and showcasing other arts, the regime looks civilized to its citizens, to its allies, to the rest of the world. And Shakespeare was a powerful cultural icon that Germany could flaunt because, as one author said it, Shakespeare is one of us. <laughs> well, how could Germany claim Shakespeare as a Germanic playwright? Well, in fact, some Germans were seeing Shakespeare in 1586 when a first troop of English actors from Leicester's troupe, headed by William Kemp, came to the court of Dresden. There are places in England that had not seen Shakespeare while the German court at Dresden was enjoying him. <laughs> Other English actors followed, so Germany was acquainted with Shakespeare as early as the 16th century. From the 19th century onwards, Germans staged more of the Bard's plays than the British did. And the Bard's popularity was due in part because of the successful translation adaptations by Schlegel and Tieck. They focused not only on Shakespeare's words, but also sound, rhythm, feeling of the language. Over the next century, the schlegel Tieck versions became a central work of German culture. So certainly, German's adoration for Shakespeare was on the stage and the page. The playwright Gerhard Hauptmann argued Germany's right to own Shakespeare. He said this in a public address, quote, there is no nation, not even the English, that has acquired the right to claim Shakespeare as the German nation has. Shakespeare's figures are part of our world. His soul has become one with ours. And even if he was born and is buried in England, Germany is the land where he truly lives. Well, other critics and scholars climbed on that bandwagon. His portrait was examined by racial experts who conveniently proclaimed that he revealed solidly Nordic characteristics. Another scholar asserted that Shakespeare displayed a fundamental Nordic-Germanic disposition. The notorious Gunther, one of the founders of Nazis' racial theories, looked at Shakespeare from a eugenic perspective. Shakespeare's heroines, he believed, were the racially superior sort of girls our good German boys should marry. Shakespeare was even interpreted as anti 
English. So, how did the National Socialists or Nazis shape text and performance to foster national identity and tell citizens how to think, how to behave? If a National Socialist, i.e. Nazi approved translator, couldn't produce a viable script, Directors decided it was best to use the old-fashioned, heroic, slightly romantic, schlegel, teak version. Or, the dramaturg Schlosser would approve cuts of the script that made the play acceptable. Obviously, you had to send in your script to the dramaturg before you could produce them. So, for some directors, though, it was safer to stick with the non-political comedies. Here is a production of Midsummer Night's Dream, done in the kind of romantic, sweet style that will go with the uh, gentle romantic acting of the early 19th century Schlegel Teak. This is um, a Hamlet, however, and it is also the Schlegel Teak translation. And um, <coughs> it's important to note here how important Hamlet was to Germans. They figured Hamlet is Germany. You thought they made extravagant claims for Shakespeare. The claims were even more extravagant for, um, for Mr. Hamlet. Since the late 18th century, Hamlet, his character, his role in the play, was understood to scholars and audiences as he, a sensitive, intelligent young man whose conscience won't allow him to avenge his father's death. Hamlet was literally paralyzed by a moral dilemma that he faced. His very inability to act was called the, quote, Hamlet sickness, end quotes. Early German 19th century political activists thought this Hamlet sickness was a key to understanding why the <coughs> numerous hundreds of German states could not, would not, unite to create a modern nation. Remember, it was only 1871 Germany came together under the Prussian state. So Hamlet was revered as an iconic figure who embodied German character. He was a key to national identity, second only to Faust, to Goethe's Faust. But Nazis obviously couldn't tolerate a passive thinker, a man whose conscience will not allow him to take revenge. In this time of economic and military expansion, the Nazis declared, we need to see um, ourselves as dynamic men of heroic action. They had to change Hamlet's character <coughs> to make him conform to the national socialist ideals. Hamlet forthwith was to be played as a self-conscious, self-confident rather, man of destiny and action, a calculating, avenging hero. And best if he is avenging and calculating from the very first scene in the play. This is the famous actor Gustav uh, Grugens. Grugens. I knew I was going to do this. Grugens. And uh, Lothar Muto directed a spectacular Hamlet at the leading German stage, the Prussian State Theater, in 1936. And Mutel took huge liberties with the text. For example, for example, he cut the first scene, the ghost on the battlements. In the fourth act, he cut many lines, especially anything about vacillating or not being able to make up his mind. Hamlet did not have the soliloquy how all occasions do inform against me. Any hint of indecision was cut. Hamlet was the plotting avenger from the start of the play. An American critic, Janet Flanner, described the production. Now, you don't see the rest of the set or the costumes. Here, she said, was a new and strictly Nordic version of the melancholy Dane. With his castle built of rough logs, his rampart guards wrapped in fur raglans with wool mufflers tied over their ears. And not one ghost, but many were doomed to walk the earth amidst shadow and macabre lighting effects. Never has Shakespeare's most thoughtful play seemed so violent. Grunjan's Hamlet is a prince who wants revenge, 
and madness rather than posy and speculation as his somber dress. He shouts, he whispers. His mother and stepfather scream with weary woe. Ophelia in her floral madness climbs tables and chairs distributing her rude. Grudgen's finest readings seem marred by his narcissism. From the grave Dicker's comedy, the whole well-calculated well production slipped into disorder in Grudgen's death scene, endlessly prolonged by marching soldiers, trumpets, and presenting of arms, it seemed almost burlesque. One visitor, at least, left the theater with the impression that Hamlet was going to be given a fine party funeral. <laughs> this was one of the most successful productions in the entire history of the Third Reich. Almost 200 sold-out performances, a record for the State Theater in Berlin. The majority, including Goebbels, saw Gustav Grunzen's portrayal as a new Hamlet for this time. Hamlet as the calculating active director of a political tale in which, filled with obsession, he raises himself to the stature of an avenging conscience at the decadent royal court. Instead of a melancholy man, we have a man of action. And he plotted revenge from the first moment. Grinchitz was always good at playing scorn and sarcasm so some reviewers, not all, just a few, interpreted the actor's cold manner, the way he hung back and isolated himself from other actors. They saw him as a sort of anti-hero who stands back and disapproves of the rotten state uh, of Denmark. And for Denmark, read the word Germany, uh, that needed an avenging hero. The one young man wrote about his impression of this production. In his view, Hamlet finds himself trapped in a police state. In the plays, the tragedy of the intellectual in the midst of a dreadful society and a criminal state. The young man wrote, quote, did theater goers understand the play and the performance in a manner similar to mine? Perhaps only a small minority. But could it have escaped the Nazis, their cultural politicians and journalists, that this Hamlet could also be understood as a political manifesto, a protest against the tyranny in Germany, in quotes. Obviously, the Nazis were oblivious to the anti-hero aspects. Goebbels called this 1936 a, quote, pinnacle of German theatrical art, in quotes. Well, what could be a better anti-Semitic, <laughs> wonderful for the Nazis play than The Merchant of Venice? So, to avoid creating any sympathy for Shylock, the Ministry of Propaganda needed a huge, new, authorized version, adaptation. The writer and party member, Hermann Koplin, <coughs> presented various suggestions for, quote, improving the existing 19th century Schlegel T translations, in quotes. According to Kreplin, it was imperative to incorporate what he termed a gentle reshaping of some parts of the Merchant of Venice. What he did was make extensive changes to the text. Above all, he was concerned about Jessica, Shylock's daughter. She could not marry the Christian Lorenzo. Since 1935, race laws declared a Jew marrying a Christian was totally illegal. In Copeland's version of the play, Jessica heeds her father's call for help, stays with Shylock, and does not marry Lorenzo. I can't imagine the last act without her there. <laughs> Other productions used another solution to the Jessica problem, she was cast as a Christian foster daughter of Shylock. <laughs> so she could legally run away from Shylock and marry her Christian Lorenzo. <laughs> Directors had to cut all lines that were favorable to Shylock or that aroused any sympathy for him. This meant at least a hundred lines were cut, especially the indispensable Act Three, Scene One speech, I am a Jew. Hath not a Jew eyes? Hath not a Jew hands, organs, dimensions, senses, affections, passions? Fed with the same food? Hurt with the same weapons? Subject to the same diseases? Healed by the same means? 
And that speech ends with, if a Christian wrong a Jew, what would his, should his sufferance be by Christian example? By revenge. The villainy you teach me, I will execute, and it shall go hard, but I will better the instruction. Croplin claimed that Shakespeare himself showed, excuse me, himself showed great concern about the racial issues in the play and that Shakespeare obviously hated Jews. <laughs> so the Reich dramaturg, Rainer Schlosser, wrote to Goebbels <coughs> to request permission to license the new adapted play as a ser you know, as a fine piece of anti-Semitic propaganda, saying, I see no reason why this classical work, which could only, um, which could very well foster support for our anti-Jew campaign, if the right actors could be found, should not be permitted in Berlin again. The message read loud and clear to producers and directors. By the beginning of the war, the Shakespeare yearbook was pleased to report that all new productions of Merchant refrained from presenting Shylock in an apologetic manner. I'd like to note one successful pro production that skirted the difficulties of the text by turning the play into pure comedy, reducing Shylock to a comic buffoon. This most influential production was Lutar Mutals, Vienna 1943 production with Werner Kross as Shylock. Detailed descriptions of the production survive, which, you know, document that every positive trait in Shylock's character had been excised. Mutal staged a comic version of the play that reduced Shylock to a true blunderer like Malvolio in Twelfth Night, someone stupid enough to be swindled. But as Shylock entered the stage, the play took on a slightly darker tone. According to one critic, something, quote, revoltingly foreign, something amazingly despicable slinks across the stage, in quotes. The text and tone made the play truly anti-Semitic. Uh, Krauss was praised for his ability to present Shylock as alien and disgusting. The actor was lauded for playing him in a way no, no unimaginative Jew could ever come up with. <coughs> and one critic said, and I quote, the affected way of shuffling along, the hopping and stamping about in a rage, the clawing hand gestures, the raucous or mumbling voice. All this makes up the pathological picture of the East European Jewish type in all his external and internal dirtiness, emphasizing danger through humor. Mutal's production diminished Shylock to a pantomime villain Audiences greeted his terms with laughter, and this silly, you know, portrayal appealed to audiences. The production proved to be good box office and received wide press coverage. The National Socialists were pleased that Cross's pantomime villain undercut the serious and politically charged undertones of a text that is arguing justice versus mercy. Goebbels saw this play as a success and planned to make a movie of it, even though officials saw the uh, production as good propaganda. Was the silly buffoon an effective portrayal of the dangerous Jews that Nazis wanted their people to fear? Nazi propagandists naively believed that the words of the text were the only things that mattered. If actors spoke the words in a decorous manner, nobly declaiming them. They were in period costumes, no boisterous or sexually charged by play. If the directors stage plays in a period set in costumes, the audience would automatically receive the uplifting and educational message of Shakespeare's characters as Nordic models of courage and heroism. Noble examples would automatically inspire citizens to behave nobly. The propaganda ministry truly did not understand that the text is a skeleton fleshed out by living artists whose gestures, tone of voice, can carry meanings that subvert or distort or change in so many ways the literal meanings of the word on the page. The part
party all decided all they had to do was select the text, give a little guidance in the program notes, check what the uh, critics were saying, and presto, their job was done. They didn't realize they couldn't control meaning. Different audiences take away different messages from the same production. Ultimately, the Nazis did not succeed in turning the theater into a means of political enlightenment. They had control over personnel and repertoires, that's true, but their grandiose ideas were vague and general and nobody was able to come up with a specific practical plan to shape the thoughts and change values or the scripts that instructed people how to act. Goebbels, Schlosser, Hitler himself, in speech after speech, extolled the virtues of this nebulous concept of Germanness, the purity of the folk, spirit. But the National Socialists failed to shape public opinion through Shakespeare. Now, Shakespeare, as a cultural icon, could certainly do one thing. It could persuade audiences, as they were sitting there in their nice theaters watching a play, that they, the Germans, lived in a culture, decent country, with the best morals and the best manners. And perhaps audiences did have a vain hope that loving Shakespeare would somehow make them civilized. The legacy of the war left Germany in financial, emotional, and spiritual tatters. Shakespeare was due for a political revision in the post-war times when Germans grappled with their past. Germany repudiated its approach to Shakespeare along with its repudiation of Nazi ideas. Britain, on the other hand, built upon its initial wartime government of support of theater. Thank you.